will start soon. Okay, it's recording now. Okay, we're just going to turn the system down. Uh, we are in process right now. And that's what we always tell people on a actual tour is that it's a production facility, not necessarily a retail facility. And uh, so, you know, there's a little bit of environmental stuff that we have to leave running a little bit. You can tell me if it's if it's not coming through clearly in terms of sound and, and we can turn it down a little bit more yet if we have to. It's uh, sounding good to me. Is uh, it? Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to show you the outside the building while Steven preps the plant up here. So that's a building we put up just two and a half years ago, specifically for this plant. And uh, it's located in Rostern, Saskatchewan, which is uh, my hometown and, and where we, we currently farm. It's between the uh, south and, and north Saskatchewan rivers. So it's about 15 minutes for us from each river. And uh, the Sask Valley is a world-class area for growing malting barley. Saskatchewan and the Canadian prairies in general are all world-class areas. And uh, so basically, it's actually amazing how much malt barley we grow in Saskatchewan. Manitoba does really good quality as well, but in terms of amount, they're quite a bit less. And our barley goes all through the United States, China, Japan, and all around the world. And people really know that Saskatchewan barley is, and, and Canadian prairie barley is high quality, and they look for that. So I think that's a, kind of the start to why, why we got going, is that we saw ourselves growing this really high quality barley in the Sask Valley. And uh, normally, malting, just like brewing, is a, has been a very consolidated industry. So all of our stuff would go in and mix off with a thousand other farmers and they would kind of come to a generic spec. And you, you lose a little bit of that high end quality and even that special, you know, traceability about this is from this certain field and this is how we grew it, you know, specifically to make it the best that we could. And, and so that was a little bit of the origin of our, our operation here. We thought craft beer is really exploding and, uh, We've got this high quality barley that we're growing in one of the best areas in the world. You know, can we be a part of it? So that's, that's kind of the story. Um, this year, someone asked earlier, but I noticed a few people have joined. We've got about 750 acres of barley. We've got Copeland, um, which is a mainstay for us, created at the University of Saskatchewan. It's, a, it's a, the number one variety in the world. And uh, we've also got a variety trial with Fraser, connect and uh, copper and copper is looking like a really neat new craft uh, craft beer variety so that'll be something that you know we're doing through a small uh, amount of acres and, and basically testing it out and we'll have people come tour that uh, COVID dependent but last year we even had you know big monsters from China come tour our farm to see some of the new varieties in terms of growing uh, our farm, it's not me, it's my dad and his longtime partner have been very, very good growers of barley, malt barley for a long time. Well known for being good at what they do. And since we started this, uh, we've had to actually tell them, you know, well, we want it different. So you can probably guess how well that goes over, you know, son telling dad, you know, I know you're really good at this, but I want it different. And uh, since we've been malting and, and seeing and talking to our end users, we understand, you know, all of those connections and what makes barley from the field optimal for a brewer. And uh, so we've gotten a lot pickier and uh, certainly changed our agronomy, our farming practices to kind of meet, meet our needs. So I guess, I guess that's kind of the beginning. Um, when we harvest our barley, we... we uh, clean it on the farm, just like we would for seeding for the next year. So it comes into the plant really clean. We have a, a storage bin outside. And basically from there, uh, we bring it into our operation. So we'll, we'll kind of show you here. So this outside is a bin and uh, this red auger here that you see in the, in the phone um, loads up our, our tank, which is in our operation, the tank is uh, where the, 
barley stays the whole time. So in, in kind of more traditional malting, the barley moves three times at least. And uh, in small batch kind of craft malting, often it stays in one tank, which is nice because you don't damage the barley during movement. So right in front of you here, that's our, that's our malt vessel, stainless steel tank. And, and currently we're in operation. We just paused it for the tour. And Stephen, if you can you take them over to, to see the barley in the tank? Yeah. So we'll go up on the tank here and we'll take a look at what's inside. Woo! Alright. So this uh, bat batch is in uh, germination day two. So it's already gone through the steeping process and Matt's going to talk about that a little bit. But right now it's growing pretty strong. You're getting rootlet growth. Um, we're seeing the acro spire grow and we're going to talk about that. But I don't know if you're going to be able to see in here, but you know, this is our tank. We've got a big manhole. I think you can see a little bit. And um, one of the interesting things to note is that big agitator in the middle. And Matt's just turning it now. And that's how we stir the barley. And that's really important. Uh, it keeps everything from sticking together in the tank. The rootlets will grow together. It makes a big mess. So we, gotta, we have to move the, move the barley around in the tank. And that's how we do it. There's a big flighting system right up in the middle. And this is the big motor that drives it. Yeah, sorry. Virtual, it's gonna be interesting. So this is another look at the tank through a couple portals here. And uh, you can see lots of rootlets on there. So nor normally what I do next is I, I tell people the reason that we have to malt barley. And uh, the reason is that barley coming off the field is a very complex carbohydrate. It's very grassy and starchy. And the sugars in there aren't available to the yeast in the brewing process. So if you were to chew barley straight off the field, it, it's actually very difficult. There's no crunch to it. Um, and you think of the animals that we feed it to, like cows, and they actually had need, you know, a, a, a four stomach system to, to digest it. So it's, it's just not ready for the malting or the brewing process, sorry. Um, it's a little bit like a chicken embryo growing in an egg. Um, the barley kernel has an endosperm, a chicken egg has an embryo, and it's gonna use the energy of that embryo to grow. In the case of barley, um, we've got some that we floor malted for you guys for this tour just so that we could pick it up easily and show you. So you can see it's pushing out a ton of rootlets, right? And uh, as it's doing that growing process, it's actually using the energy in the embryo, in the endosperm, and its biochemistry changes dramatically. So it comes from a very carb complex carbohydrate, very starchy, and it slowly changes as it grows and uses up that energy into a simpler sugar that's more accessible to the yeast in the brewing process. So that's, that's the rationale for brewing. Uh, it's called modification. And that uh, process is really why malting exists. If there's any other questions on that side of things, we can surely take them now or at the end. But, but that's the reason why, why you have to malt barley. Um, Stephen's going to try to grab you an acrospire he's he's never had to do it under this much pressure before but so you see the ro the rootlets are one of the areas of growth but the other area that is actually growing out is the shoot and the shoot is is what's going to come out of the ground it's going to be hard to see that okay so do you guys see can you see that at all yes. right there that's, yeah. that's the acrospire, and that's the green shoot that's going to grow out of the ground. And that's what's using a lot of the energy from the endosperm. So as that comes out of the ground, uh, eventually it's able to use the sun and photosynthesis, but initially it needs the energy in the, in the seed to get out, right? And interestingly enough, the length of that acrospire, so where am I here? <laughs> right there. Right now that one's about... 
50% of the length of the kernel, the length of that actor spire tells me how well modified the kernel is. So we're constantly checking that. Um, when it's about as long as the kernel is itself, that tells us that we've got about 100% modification of our, of our malt. So that's, that's kind of a, it's a really, you know, non-tech type of uh, measurement, but it's very accurate. So that's, that's really interesting. So there's some, some floor malted barley. Uh, you know, we, we could sell you that, that, that couple pounds there. Be like a uh, big premium though, big premium. <laughs> All right. So we're going to tell you a little bit more about the system. And uh, Stephen's going to grab this here. So malting takes three steps. And uh, the three main steps are steeping, germination, and kilning. They all occur in this vessel in our system. Steeping is basically the way that we wake up a dormant barley kernel and get it to start growing. So you take it in from the farmer's bin at about 14% moisture content. And in steeping, just like steeping tea, we're trying to basically hydrate and uh, we drive that kernel up to 45%. So you're unable to do that in just one shot underwater because barley and it's the only one of all the commodities that we grow but it's a living thing the whole time and it has to be so we can't drown it so we can put it underwater you know depending on the variety and and the year but we can put it underwater 8 10 12 hours comfortably but then we have to drain that water off give it an air rest allow it to sit warm up grow and then we have to put it underwater again and uh, basically a typical operation would take three steeping uh, wet steeps and three air rests and then we would be taking measurements along the way and getting us up to 45 percent where we know it's ready to move into germination so that's kind of our metric there and uh, germination uh, all the rest of this skid starts to do its work so if we start at the at my right i guess it might be your left but that's the the blower, the yellow and green outfit, um, moving along. So that's just a big fan. And we've got a, a very large commercial furnace here. We've got a chiller loop right here. And then we've got a misting chamber that vaporizes water into the air. And all of that starts to activate. That's what the noise was earlier. Um, it was all working because we're in germination. And really what you're doing there is you're creating an optimal environment for the barley to grow. So you're controlling your temperature, you're controlling your humidity, and you're controlling your airflow. Uh, those are all critical. Um, airflow is critical because the process of malting is an exothermic process. It creates heat, creates heat and carbon dioxide. And if you're not removing that heat and carbon dioxide from the, the malt barley bed, you'll actually get spoilage, just like you would if you had a bunch of wet grain sitting together in a pile. So you have to have airflow moving through there and we use the amount of airflow to control the temperature and the pace of our process so airflow temperature control and and humidity control are very crucial germination is usually a four-day process and we're watching for that moisture content to stay around 45 percent we're looking for the right growth and we're trying to basically either speed it up or slow it down based on on the other environmental conditions. So outside conditions can be, uh, play a big role, humidity and temperature. So the difference between malting at minus 30 degrees and in very dry, cold Saskatchewan, or plus 25 degrees with humidity is, is big. We'll show you our, uh, our schematic now a little bit and show you all the different kind of controls and I guess uh, buttons we can play with during the process. So come on over. Now, it really doesn't like us right now because we, we stopped it for you guys. So it's, it's given us error codes. But basically, this is a schematic of our operation. Steeping tank and all these metrics are different numbers that we're controlling during the, uh, the process. Here's our blower, furnace, our humidity loop, um, chiller loop in here. And every one of our malts has a recipe that we can go to so if i take like a rye pale ale for instance pale malt you jump in it's going to ask me about the three main phases of malting and then just for an example 
in germination, there's lots and lots of targets and metrics that we play with uh, to kind of tune everything in. And this system, we're able to access it from our computer or our cell phone, and it does run 24-7 uh, when we're in batch. All the things that are supposed to move um, recipe-wise will move automatically based on an air over electric system. So the electrical requirements of this building are, are very high. We have 600, 240, 480, and 120 amp services. And uh, it's all programmed through software to take it through the recipe. However, we're constantly adjusting it to make sure it's optimized. I think like the next thing that we do after germination, we, we decide that it's fully modified and uh, using, using the acro spires, and then we get into kilning. And kilning's kind of, uh, it's that part of the process where just like a baker, we can get creative and we can really create some special things. So the big, the big maltsters, uh, they'll do mostly base malts, like two row, um, some pilsners, that type of thing. And then some of the bigger maltsters will get into lots of different various malts, uh, all the way in through, Viennas, Munichs, um, caramels, and darker malts that will then eventually take roasting. And, and we can do lots of different malts. Stephen made a couple of hot steeps for you to kind of showcase the range that we can do. Um, but I'm gonna get Stephen to tell you a little bit about the kilning process and what we watch out for, and then what else, what we can kind of make out of the end. So we're gonna switch roles for a minute. Yeah, so uh, the kilning process is I think arguably the most fun part of the malting process. Uh, you get a little bit away from the, the technical side and move into the creative a little bit. Um, obviously, kilning is where we like create the flavor. It's where we add heat, uh, airflow, um, all the same, all the same variables that we're using to control everything throughout the process. But now we're ramping it up a bunch. We're using that fan that we showed you earlier at um, 3,000 CFMs, which is a lot of airflow through this tank and we'll heat it up to different different temperatures at different parts throughout the drying process to create different flavors and um, you know it, it, you get into like creating melanoidins and other things and and when you apply heat compared to when you have moisture in your in your kernel uh, dictates what the final flavor of the of the of the uh, kernel is going to be and that's what is going to flow all the way through to the beer so yeah, so it's a fun part of the process. It's a stressful part of the process, but it's really fun. Um, Stewing's a good example. Oh, yeah, and, like, you know, you can get into stuff, like, if we want to make a caramel malt, which we do, we make three caramels, a 60, a 40, and a 30 right now. Um, it's a really interesting part of the process because instead of this whole system drying out where we just turn on the airflow and let the, the moist air roll out into the environment, we let that moist air roll back into the process it circulates through, and what we do is a, um, uh, yeah, well, it's, it's a mashing process, so it's a sacrification, and so we pick a mash temp, um, and we actually mash all the grains inside the kernel, and that creates the precursor to certain flavor components that when then we go to dry it down, when we apply that high heat, you get different types of flavor. And, that, and that's the basis of a caramel malt or a crystal malt. You know, it's, it's still the same grain and it's often the same steeping and the same germinating regime, but by using that stewing process where you get the sacrification and the mashing, which you're all familiar with, you change the final flavor of the grain when you apply heat to it. Yeah. The process is really important at this point. For sure. So I'll, I guess I'm gonna show you guys our, our lab quickly. It's, you know, just a, small lab but important for us to kind of keep our our metrics in so we have a moisture tester we're aiming for 45 percent moisture during this phase like we told you before so we're close there and uh we have a friabilometer which is an industry specific machine that looks very basic but costs five thousand dollars from germany unbelievable um and uh after we're done our process through through the kilning phase, the last thing we do is we uh, we clean out. So we take it through a debeerder, 
That's a little screw auger that turns off all of the rootlets and any loose hulls or anything that we don't need in our final product. And then this is a clipper cleaner. Clipper's a, a long, long, long held since 1869 grain cleaning company. So we have our small clipper cleaner. We have a really large dust control unit because a lot of the uh, brewers that we talked to didn't like how much chaff and dust were in their bags of malt. So that pulls dust out at numerous spots in the operation. And then we have our bagging line. So we bag all the, almost all our product that goes to professional brewers in 25 kg bags. And uh, that's our system for doing that. And we palletize and there's our inventory sitting there. Um, for home brewers like you guys, we do have smaller bags that we send out and uh, we have our little home brewing kind of fill station over here with all of our different products. So you'll see, uh, you know, there's a Munich 10, a malted rye. Basically, those are all our products there. And if you guys were on the uh, in-person tour, we'd be trying those and having a beer ready. But we're not. So basically, I, what I want to do next is something that I think is very important and is really interesting. And it's called the malt sensory analysis. So we can take a second and, and maybe, Sean, you can see if there's any questions on, on maybe like the malting process or the farming side or anything that's more process related. And we can maybe tackle those now. And then I want to go through the malt sensory analysis with you guys, which I think you're going to like. Sounds good. Uh, if anyone has any questions, just uh, write it into the chat. And I'll read it out. That way we can manage how many people are talking at once. Perfect. I'll, I'll show you what Steven's doing while we prepare. So he made, he made some hot steeps earlier, which are barley teas uh, that go through mash temp and conversion. And that's what we use to, to do our malt sensory analysis. And we've got Maker's Midnight. Over there, right, Stephen? Yes, sir. So that's our darkest malt at 80 SRM. A really, really interesting malt that we make in a unique process that I don't think anybody else does. And what else did you make? The other two are, uh, this is a brand new Pilsner malt here, and we're comparing it with a legacy Pilsner malt to make sure we're keeping up with our process. Awesome. I think I saw a question come in. Yep. Uh, sorry, I just got to flip back here. Uh, so we got a few questions. The first one is from Kyle. What are some of the some of the potential malting process problems that give you nightmares? <laughs> oh, good oh goodness. Um, well, it's minus thirty. Did my furnace turn on when the program told it to? Uh, that was that was a big problem at the beginning with software. So the the recipe that's involved. Uh, it's very complex and I can't go in and I can change the recipe dynamics and parameters, but I can't change the back end without a computer programmer. So, uh, boy, we were the second people in North America to get this, this craft malting equipment. And I think we were really the first to commercialize it. So we were working out bugs and I was sleeping in the plant for many, many days, um, because something could go wrong at two in the morning and, if you weren't there to address it, big issues. You could, you know, depends on what the problem was. I mean, if, if the furnace cut out, well, you've got frozen grain and, and potentially a ruined batch. If, if a tap opened at the wrong time, well, your huge tank of, of water with head pressure has just blown out the side through, through your whole ducting system and the plant, you know, the plants flooded and all of those things certainly happened and, and many more. Uh, another thing that happened, was our agitator was supposed to be specced out to really, you know, robust specs, but they were, they were specking it on uh, American barley. So a big mistake when it came out here and had the heavy growth and heavy weight of Saskatchewan barley. Uh, first of all, we weren't able to turn it. Um, and then when we got our motor increased, we've got a 600 to one gear ratio on the top of there. And we used to have a 10 horsepower motor. Um, we got the motor increased to 15 horsepower. So it should give you, you know, 150% of the power. Well, now we could turn, but all the welds cracked. 
so there was a lot of growing pains in terms of being at the front end of, of this industry. Like there, there was no template for us at that time. No one else was craft malting in Western Canada when we were building out. Now there's a few guys. Uh, but uh, yeah, those were some of the things that kept us up at night. I mean, I honestly could go on on this one for a long time, but I'm going to stop now. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Sean Richens has a, a question. A club sure. member keeps trying to motorize his mash tun. So I have a question about your agitator. I see an auger about one sixth the tank diameter. Are there also paddles? Does it always run pumping downwards? No, it always run augers as, as a rule run coming upwards. Um, and the flighting moves them in that direction. On the very bottom of our, of our tank, I'll actually probably be easier if I show you on the tank here. But so this is the door, our exit door into our unload system. And at this level here is a false bottom. So below that level on the tank is all, uh, there's grates that allow water and airflow to go through, but there's a false bottom. And running on top of that false, or of those grates is a, well, I don't know what we call it, but it's just a, it's an arm on the bottom of the auger that's about the same diameter as the tank. So it brings in the grain to the center. It moves up the center and comes down the side and rotates through like that. And about eight minutes, we'll rotate our batch. And, and when we're unloading, just out of interest, you turn the uh, agitation arm the other way and those paddles at the bottom push the barley out of the tank. Yeah, it, be, it all feeds out right out the front of this tank here. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Uh, Jeff Stacy has a question. Sure. What is the forecast? Oh, just bounced. What is the forecast for malt grade barley this year? Well, it's early. It's early, Jeff. Um, I would say on my farm, fantastic. I That's we great. we seeded uh, May second and third. Our, uh, our first barley, which is all Copeland, it was up and we had one night, one or two nights that were quite cold and we saw it ding up a little bit in terms of frost. So just a bit, a bit of yellowing, but it, it come, it's already come past that. It's all green and we had a two inch rain on, I don't know, days are, days are all merged together in a pandemic and, <laughs> and seeding. But about three days ago, we had a two inch rain so the barley looks awesome. And uh, there are some photos of that, um, videos of that on, on our Instagram if you want to take a peek at it. Uh, in terms of the worldwide barley forecast, it's, it'll be interesting. I mean, it's very weather dependent, obviously, as all crops are. But we do have probably a surplus of malt barley available at this time. Uh, China will take a lot of it. And they've just recently slapped a, a basically a debilitating tariff on Australian barley, which was their number one supplier. We'd probably be their number two supplier or maybe three. But uh, so it, it'll be interesting to see what kind of supplies come out of Canada into China. Um, but I, I don't think there's any nobody's worried about a shortage currently. All the maltsters feel like they're well supplied. Uh, and I'm you know, that's not really me. That's more the commercial system because. We only need 200 tons of high quality malt barley every year, which, I mean, if I don't have it, a neighbor will have it. And if a neighbor doesn't have it and I have to drive somewhere in Western Canada to get it, that's only five super bees. Uh, five super bees is not a lot in modern West Canadian farming. So uh, on a small scale craft malt uh, supply is, I never lose sleep over supply. Let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, Ryan Gren has, uh, has a question. What does the machine that costs $5,000 do? <laughs> yeah. Nothing. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> so, like I said, it's industry standard. And so that's part of the reason that it's so expensive and German made. But uh, I think the it's a little difficult to explain, but it's a friability test. So on lots of your malt COAs, you will see friability or you might see friability. It's something that we use as a metric all the time. 
And friability is really a proxy measurement of modification. How well did you modify that grain? How well did you take it through steeping and germinating? And, you know, did you do a good job of the, the reason that we malt, which is modification from a starchy carbohydrate to a simple sugar that the yeast can then use to make alcohol? And we actually third party test every single batch. It's one of the things we do for quality control. So every batch of ours goes out to Hartwood College, which we think is fantastic in New York State. And uh, they give us a robust analysis of every batch. And when we give you malt, you get the exact spec specs from that batch, not a range of specs that our Pilsner sits within. You get the exact specs of that batch, but we have to wait three weeks for that. So if we've done a new, something new and we want to be able to check into process in real time, the friability meter is really the only tool we have in our lab that, you know, we can make adjustments tomorrow or today versus waiting for those results to come back. Can I comment on that? And Stephen would like to comment. Yeah. So just like back to the friability meter and like it measures modification, like as, as our kernel gets wet and modifies, basically what's happening is there's like the starch that's so inaccessible loosens up. And so this machine, just after this is all done, it's got this soft um, rubber roller and it rolls the grains through there. And anything that's too hard to break up in the grain means that it hasn't modified. So that starch that's so inaccessible is still inaccessible. So all it does is it breaks apart the stuff that's been modified. It leaves behind the hard stuff that hasn't had a chance to modify. And then we weigh that and that's my, and that's friability. Yeah, yeah, I guess I should have said that. Like friability, you know, a rough definition of it, sometimes called the steely tip. Yes, yes, Jeremy. Steely tip. Uh, we call those uh, pugs, partially unmodified grains. That's, that's in-house. But uh, fr the definition of friability loosely is how crackable or crunchable or breakable you are. So it's basically checking that. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, the next question is uh, from Jeremy. Uh, oh, when you oh. talk about using an experimental or new barley varieties, what are you looking for as a farmer? And is it di that different from when a, what a brewer would be looking for? Oh, yeah. Steven just he grabbed the phone. I thought he no, was no, ready I'm to say something. Oh, okay. you're, the, you're the farmer. Okay, so I'm going to put on like my farming hat first to take I didn't bring it. Um, so from the farmer's perspective, we're using a lot of Copeland and secondarily a lot of Metcalf. And the percentage of those that are used in uh, the, the commodity malting world is very high. Like it was like as high as 92% a couple years ago. It's moved down a little bit now, like maybe 80%, but it's still like, uh, it's probably actually more like 70, 72 now, but incredibly high percentage is Copeland and Metcalf. And from a farmer's perspective, you're looking at these barleys that were fantastic, but they were bred 20 plus years ago now. So if I'm looking at wheat or canola or any of the other things that I grow, the breeding over 20 years is massively different. Like I'd be laughed off the farm if I was using a wheat or a canola seed that was bred 20 years ago because it's yield, it's uh, standability, it's disease resistance, it's ability to thrive in different moisture conditions are all like 20 years ahead, right? So the problem with barley is that your end users, like I talked about earlier, the brewers, you know, let's talk AB InBev or whoever else, and the maltsters are, were so consolidated for so long. And their desires are to have a consistent product and uh, not to make changes and, you know, to be able to recreate taste over and over. So a Bud Light tastes like a Bud Light tastes like a Bud Light. And uh, so they don't really care about the agronomics on the farm. And we've had lots of barley varieties that have tried to come in and take over. And for one reason or the other, they weren't accepted by the big customers at the end. And sometimes for legitimate reasons and sometimes not. But so you don't have any changeover. So from a farmer's perspective, these new varieties are very valuable because they've, they've got better characteristics. And, uh, you know, I think that's the, probably the biggest issue with that. Like that's the, the biggest response I would have to that question. 
from a maltster's perspective, varieties can come in with very different characteristics. Um, and specifically, the biggest kind of two differences would be adjunct brewing malt varieties like Metcalf that have high enzyme because they need that high enzyme to convert non-malted grains like corn and rice, like AB and BEP. Or you can have more all, all barley varieties like the Copeland would be. And certainly, you know, in our plant, we're more interested in that. So we really like copper because it's got all these new characteristics on the farm and it should have all of the great characteristics that Copeland's had in terms of, you know, ability to go through the Malthouse and brewery. So you get, you can get into like all these kind of really crazy, interesting things like taste variability and stuff between varieties. But in a macro sense, those are very secondary to the other issue. Yeah. And if somebody's about to ask, about variety and how that differs in taste that's like a seven hour conversation that we're not gonna have probably <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> all, all i would say like the, the quick answer to that is i can impact the taste in my kiln a thousand times more than i can impact the taste with with variety so i mean the only way that i think you could even have that conversation is if you're making a very like Pilsner style malt where you really, really just kiln it just, just to the bare minimum. And then you might get, you can talk about terroir and variety, maybe in a Pilsner, maybe a two row, but anything past that, you're all, you're all talking about the baking process, I would say. Yeah. All right. Uh, we got three more questions. Okay. Well then let's do those. And then we got to do this malt sensory because it's a lot of fun. For sure. So uh, Don says, uh, or, uh, is asking, are certain varieties of barley better for malting, making certain malts? Example, Copeland, Pale, Metcalf, or for Metcalf from Munich? Um, I would say, like, one thing I've often commented on is that higher protein barley will basically allow itself to take up more... Uh, more color and more flavor um, more easily. So a lot of times I would say like our Sask ba barley, Sask Valley barley wants to be a Vienna malt. Like it would love to be 4.5 SRM, get like crackery, bready notes, and just like be a very, very robust base malt or a specialty malt um, somewhere in the middle of those two. And so like things like that, like protein or or whatever can certainly make a malt better for some, for some varieties than other. And on the flip side of that would, would be like a Pilsner where it's nice to have low protein because then you can, you don't have to be so, so careful on the kilning process to create that Pilsner malt. But I think like I kind of answered a little bit of that, about that on the other question where like a Metcalf, is designated for adjunct brewing because of its enzyme package and a, and a Copeland is, it's more versatile, but certainly more likely to be used in a craft beer scenario because it's not focused all on enzymes. It's kind of focused more on extract and, you know, modification. So that's probably what I would say on that one. Okay. Um, Next one up is, so kind of like mash efficiency, but malt efficiency? Yeah, what's the context? Yeah, I'm not sure what the, uh, maybe Dan can elaborate on that uh, in a bit. Was, I'll move on to Chris's about... question. Oh, go, go ahead, Dan. I think you're oh. piping in there. No, I was just commenting on their $5,000 machine and what it does. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Like it's, it, it'll tell us quite a bit. So friability is a proxy for modification, but it's also a pretty good proxy for extract. So, you know, did we, did we malt it well? Um, extract doesn't tell you all those things because just knowing your extract won't tell you how well you malted or modified your protein, for example, which is also important for ST ratios and free amino nitrogen, fan, those types of things. But uh, it is, yeah, it's a good measurement of how well you malted, modified, and what your extract's going to be. So, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, right. and a good brewer, a good brewer will look at that variability and adjust their recipe to, you know, hit their targets. Or look at yeah, all the COA. All the COA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And the last question is uh, from Chris Thompson. Mm -hmm. Do you ever send any of your malt to the Canadian Malting Barley Technical Center in Winnipeg for testing? Always. Yeah. They, we work with them on lots of specific projects. In terms of like our third party testing that we do with every batch, we do Hartwick because they're, they're dedicated to craft brewing, um, craft beverage. And the CMBTC in Winnipeg is more uh dedicated to commercial and research so they don't really necessarily want to get a sample every week from us to run they would but they're also more expensive for that um but no we work on special project with the cmbtc all the time with peter watts and aaron onio and and the other guys in there last year they came and toured our farm and malt house and we had a big shindig out here with um 20 Chinese uh, maltsters that run some of the biggest malting companies in the world. Uh, they ran all of our tests from our last year's fertility trial where we were working with nitrogen to try to control protein to uh, optimize our operation and uh, high, get our, the highest quality barley we could. And uh, this year, their, the variety trial that we, that we set up was set up with their input in terms of what varieties they'd like to showcase if and when they can bring a tour around, which there was a big tour planned again, but it was canceled due to COVID. So we work closely with them all the time. And I'm actually on the uh, Sask Barley board and have a seat on the Brewing and Malting Barley Research Institute, which Peter chairs, and uh, also the malt variety. Uh, it's called the PGDC, which is where we vote on which ver malting varieties that are bred should be progress towards commercialization in, in, in Canada. So yeah, we're, we're tight with those guys. We like those guys a lot. Awesome. And I okay. think that concludes the questions. So awesome. So to the next part. Yeah. Malt sensory. This is part of our tour that goes over. Awesome. Of course, this is better in person, but what we do is we make a, a hot steep and a hot steep. Um, if any of you guys are interested in how to make a hot steep, that's, you know, repeatable and, uh, goes by the uh, ASBC standards. We can send you that later, but, uh, and so just get in touch. But it's, it's kind of a protocol and uh, Stephen and I, we, we do a lot of it. And we actually were, were uh, judges at the final table of the malt cup this year in, uh, in Colorado, which uses a hot steep. So um, we do it for almost every, well, I think we do it for every batch really. Yeah, we do. We use it to for a quick uh, reference for a color um, before we get our lab results. And then basically it's about flavor. And so if anybody's got their, I imagine everybody's got a cell phone or something close to them. If you go to the app store and you could do this right now uh, and play along a little bit with us. If you go to the app store and look up draft lab, it's D-R-A-U-G-H-T lab and download that just download the free version, not the pro version. And, and that's the app that we use. And so I'll give you guys a second to kind of do that for whoever likes to, and, and you can do it. Um, you know, as we go through it, you can, you can do it with a beer that's in front of you. It's not going to be a hot steep, but it's kind of similar. Um, and, and maybe we can all do one quick kind of version together. So we remember how to do it. <laughs> so remember, remember what? Well, let's let's oh, run through one on your phone. Oh, I see what you mean. The actual yeah. app. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just bring it up and I'll show everybody what it looks like. So the malt, malt cup was fun. That was in uh, Fort Collins. We, we got to tour New Belgium. Had like a vip uh session in the night there where we got to kind of hang out in the brewery all night and have beers which was awesome yes. and uh la folie from new belgium was fantastic mm -hmm. they showed us all about their barrel age program and and really a, a cool company actually i know they're like the huge craft beer company by now but 
they still have, uh, I would say their hearts are in the right place and their ownership has like bred that throughout the company. So really awesome. Anyways, uh, you want to use the join code? Should we? If does, does, wants to join in, or yeah. It, I mean, if, so once you're well, in, yeah, I guess we can because they're not on the same thing. Once you're, yeah, once you're in the in the draft lab, what we normally do is we join. And Stephen did start one. It's, it's obviously this is not going to be like a legitimate malt sensory because we don't have the malt malt in front of all of you guys. But he has a join code of nine B two o two nine B two o two. If you want to join his uh, little malt sensory analysis. And then basically what you do is you go through the malt and, and the better the palate and the more experienced the people that you have in the room, the better your results are going to be. But the first thing that you do is you go through the visual. So I'll, why don't you do it and I'll tape you. Okay, let's keep it a little lower and then I can do both at once. Okay. So visual, the first thing is color. You're going to clip on the color and then basically you're just going to match up the color of your if you're hot steep, your wart, you can almost call it, to the color on the screen of your phone. And that's going to give you a sense of, of that. We should, I should mention this is, a, this is a Pilsner malt, so it's going to be quite light, light straw here. Okay. And then the other things that you're looking for on, on, that, on the visual phase is haze and particulate. So... Is it hazy to look through? Are there any large particulates? Are they all just small, fine particulates? So that's an easy one. Um, then you go to aroma, which is a lot more fun. Basically, just give it a, a swirl and uh, and a big kind of get the bouquet and uh, go through that first page again. No, oh, sorry, the aroma one. So you have lots of different areas. And uh, once you drill down on an area like Stephen just did, ready, it gives you some options as to how to be specific. And uh, I think it's doughy. The smell, yeah, but not yeasty or play dough, just doughy, just doughy. Okay, so that's that's one. Go ahead, doughy. Yeah, go. and then go done. And often like, we usually look for about I don't know. I mean, there's no real set number, but four or five things that you really think are prominent in the, in the tasting and in the, in the, sorry, the aroma. Get any earthiness in this? Yeah. A little bit of soil. Fresh soil. Maybe a bit of, a bit of grass or graininess, grassy or grainy, probably grainy yeah. more. Yeah. Raw barley or oats. Yeah. Oh my God. Rob Harley. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you get the picture. Um, that's the aroma is really fun. And, and you go through that one. Right, and then the, the rest is really, you know, I think a little easier. The aroma is probably the number one, you know, thing that we use. But taste, uh, you're looking at a sliding scale there of how sweet the malt is. So this Pilger malt has oh, some, nice. some sweetness. I'd say it's at least medium. No sourness and no bitterness. So you fill that in. And then on the mouthfeel, body, you know, it's the same as it is in beer. Uh, basically, is it full bodied? Does it have lots of sweetness? Do you feel like it's watery, which would be on the opposite end of that spectrum? Um, cloying is, is kind of that sweetness that might stick to your teeth like a Coca-Cola. Uh, Mouth watering. Um, what's the way way to describe that? Like does a it, sour gleeking type yeah, feeling. Yeah, yeah. Well, does it make your mouth water? Yeah, it's as simple as that. Yeah. yeah, astringency is like somewhere along the the line of uh, is like cooling. Like, does it cool your tongue? Does it uh, dry it. Does it dry it off? Dry your, your tongue. tongue. Yeah. So you fill all that stuff out, and uh, you know when we're doing it for our malts, me and Steven do it. Sometimes we have a a guest. Hey, we had three people do it. Guest analyst. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and and what it does is it actually, it consolidates your results. So like I said, the better the group of people you have in the room, the better your results are going to be. So I just want to kind of make a comment here. Somebody said this is dark amber, and I just wanted to say that you're wrong. Well, they're doing their own beer. Oh, yeah. Okay. They're doing their oh, own yeah, beer. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. I'm just teasing. 
<laughs> so anyways, that, that gives us a good, you know, description of what lots of people think it is. So if, if five people thought it was doughy and one person thought it was, uh, I don't know, what's a, what's a weird one that it, it would smells be? like barnyard. Yeah. One person thought it was barnyard. You can probably rule that one outlier out. And so that's the value of that program. And it's a, it's a really good one and you can do malt and beer. So, so that's pretty cool. Uh, if any, like I said before, if anybody wants me to just send them a screenshot of like the, the ASBC protocol on that, I sure can, but you're going to have to get in touch with me and send me your contact info. Otherwise I'm not going to do it. Basically just, just email me makers at gmail.com. Oh, here's a, so this is uh, just a just a note that we only kill them. We don't roast any malts. And roasting is how you get into stuff like chocolate malt and black patent. We don't do any of that. It's all kiln. But even on our kiln, we can make, this is the darkest we make. It's 80 SRM. We call it our midnight malt. Um, we double wet it in the drying process, which is pretty special. But 80 SRM, you can see that, like, you know, even with a kiln, you can get a massive range of flavors. And this thing's awesome. It's got tons of, like, dark fruit and... Some really nice uh, light chocolate in it. It reminds me of a, uh, you know, a, a, the classic dark malt with oh, coffee nice. and chocolate flavors, but then it's also got this interesting acidity with uh, almost like a Cabernet, like a full-bodied red wine. It's a really neat with undercurrent of uh, dark fruit, raisin, that kind of thing. It's a pretty neat process we do on that one. Anyways, uh, there might be some further questions, which we'll just hang out here for a while and people can either stay or drop off as they'd like to. Um, our website, makersmalt.com. Our uh, Instagram. Uh, I don't know. How do you do an Instagram? Makers Malt. It's Makers Malt. That's where we do most of the fun stuff about our farming and, and everything. Uh, so, you know, follow us on there. And, um, yeah, you guys can, some of the brewers in Winnipeg use our malts fairly regularly. Uh, Jeremy is one of them, and he makes the Longsword Pilsner with our Pilsner malt, which we think is awesome, and also uses some of our specialty malts uh, regularly. And so does uh, Brian Barnhammer. We've got our malts in the hands of a number of other brewers that use it here and there, but uh, hoping to have it more accessible to you guys from a... Uh, home brewer standpoint as well uh we talked to grain grain to glass uh recently so they may well have some available to you guys in the future but uh right now you got to order them directly through us and we get them out there however we get them out there uh often it's like figuring out a way and uh it's probably doable for the short term but i think some way we'll do it you know uh more consistently in the future awesome well thank you very much um uh, i think uh if you want to send me that information um sure. and i'll post it on our website so that uh and i'll post a little bit of information about this talk we'll also post it on youtube and um yeah uh this has been really awesome i i really enjoyed it uh, i've got a few uh texts from people saying that they're they're really impressed with this presentation. So good. Good job. Well, I mean, it's thanks uh, for taking the time to do this too. Yeah. Hey, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to have to go back to the Cedar, although it's, don't worry, it's running. I would never get away with that, but uh, I got to go back and help out at some point. But uh, we really like the home brewers community. Uh, Steven was an avid home brewer still is. Uh, he's brewing with our malts like, definitely weekly so we always have beer in our our cooler that's homemade and uh we are quite well involved with the ales club and the headhunters in saskatchewan and winnipeg has a soft spot for us we don't really work west very much because there's other guys that are out there um but my mom grew up in winnipeg i was in winnipeg every summer for my whole life uh and you know we 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 like that marketplace we think saskatoon and winnipeg have a lot of similarities and uh like to be more present in winnipeg at all all, all the time so feel free to, to get in touch and we'll we'll keep working our way towards you guys and uh yeah if you have any questions feel free i think like i'm i'm very accessible 
um, Jeremy would know, like, you know, if you're going to phone me on malt, you're going to get, get the guy that grew it and malted it and probably packaged and delivered it between me and Steven. And so we can answer almost everything. Bruce is, you know, and we're pretty willing to do that. Uh, we'll block you if you get really crazy. <laughs> no stalkers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's, that's, that's our spiel and, uh, definitely get in touch. We got gear too. We got gear. Hey, Steven, you're modeling awesome. anything? All sorts of stuff. Boom. Yeah. Can we just go to your website to buy the gear? Yep. Yeah. Same way as we kind of, we have our, uh, home brewer line and our our gear kind of on there and uh it's just yeah by our website and if you have any troubles with it like especially because it's winnipeg and often we drop ship to breweries so that people get free delivery in saskatchewan but if you have any trouble with ordering or something just just email me and i'll figure it out awesome the um oh yeah i think jeremy put out an offer that uh to coordinate something if uh, people wanted to do an order. Uh, but I'll let him speak to those uh, details. <laughs> I'm going to stop sure. the recording now, but uh, anyone could feel free to stay on the line. Um, yeah, we'll hang out. We'll hang